Okay, welcome again to uh, My World of Oriental Rugs. This is class six of an eight class series. And uh, today we are going to talk about the rugs from the mid 20th century. I actually refer to it as the decline in the honorable mention rugs. And we will explain both of those as we get into it a little bit more here. But um, uh, I just want to start by uh, just rem just sort of throwing out here a few of the advantages of owning an oriental rug. Of course, they are a work of art and they add beauty to uh, a room. And, and of course, they are made by hand and that's just always nice to have handmade things. They're a good investment for the most part, they always say stable or, um, and you certainly get your money's worth out of them. Uh, they are collectible, a long life expectancy, uh, they absorb sound, so it's kind of nice in a room to, especially if there's no rug in the room that, you know, there's a lot of echo and it dampens the echo. Becomes a family air room. And, um, you know, th this is a, you know, I mean, I love the fact that I'm going to be handing down uh, rugs to my kids. There used to be a great ad by a, a lady that was in business in New York, Doris Leslie Blau, and she had a one of her ads showed a picture of a grandmother, a mother, and the baby all sitting on the rug because they go from generation to generation because they last a long, long time. Of course, they cushion falls and they organize spaces. So these are all some of the advantages of owning an oriental rug. Uh, once again, I also wanted to remind you to pick up your free copy uh, of the, the little booklet called The Mystique of Oriental Rugs. It's a great little booklet. Uh, I know it's just a little thing, but it, it has a lot of good information on it, covers a lot about, you know, how rugs are made, and so on and so forth. And they're free uh, to all of our customers, just come by and ask for one. So uh, again, we'll look at the uh, timeline. We have the early history, the first great rug renaissance, the second great rug renaissance. Today, we're going to talk about this period Actually, it's 45 to 85, but uh, and then the third great renaissance, which is 85 to present. Um, <clears throat> and between 15 and 45, just not that much went on. You know, there was the wars. They produced some after the war, but uh, but slowly it just sort of it just really slowed down a lot until, you know, after World War Two. So that's just that's just history. Um, Okay, so rug weaving areas by 1960, and this doesn't include, you know, it's not complete, uh, but for the most part, the rug weaving areas from by 1960, Turkey and Iran, uh, which was Iran by then, this is all the uh, Caucasian area, but it was part of Russia at the time. It's now, uh, you know, there's Azerbaijan is in there and uh, Armenia and Georgia are all part of that. You know, the Olympics three years ago were up in, in there um, as well. Of course, Iran, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, uh, and then China produced some rugs. I don't talk that much about Chinese rugs, not that it's not an important rug. It's just that, you know, we, we can, in this, series of eight, um, we're just sort of focusing mainly in centering around Persia and Iran and just covering a little bit of everything else. But there were rugs, here's the listing of all the rugs, uh, Persia, Turkey, India, Pakistan, Kashmir, Turkmenistan, Tibet up in here someplace, and uh, Romania over here right there, and China, Afghanistan, Egypt produced some rugs actually, um, and Baluchistan, which is an area up in here someplace. Um, so let's move on here. Now, the, the only reason I show you this map is to remind you of this right up on top. The Persian Empire became Iran in March of 1935. So that's when, you know, it became Iran. And uh, as I told you, a lot of times I refer to Iranian rugs as Persian rugs just because it, everybody likes that better. It's a little more politically correct. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, it was Iran ever since 1935. So here's the question. So what happened from 1920 till 1985 between the second and third 
uh, renaissance of oriental rugs. And it's kind of interesting because as we showed you last week, you could see already in the uh, photographs I showed you of, um, of uh, uh, rugs from you know, 1880 up to 1920, there already was some, I don't know, deterioration is probably not the word. They just weren't as pretty. They got, the demand was for uh, busier designs and brighter colors. They had in, uh, developed uh, chrome dyes and they started using a lot of chrome dyes that we didn't like. But uh, so like, for instance, in, in the Persian Haris, we talked about this and I showed you some of these slides uh, last week, but it goes from what we would call a serapi to another serapi to a really pretty haris. But by 1930, they're producing what I call red, white, and blue haris. So they just have the red, the white, and uh, navy blue, and sometimes a little bit of another color. They got so uh, busy and the colors it was chrome uh, dyes and uh, they faded a little bit in the sun, even though they're not supposed to, they, they do are affected by sunlight. Um, and the, the quality just begun to get, uh, you know, went downhill. Kerman, here's a nice early piece from around 1900. Another one from around 1900, 1920. And then you see these Kermans that became so popular by the 1960s, this was the rug. I kind of laugh when I look at that little brochure that I told you you could pick up. But in there, because the, that brochure was published in 1970, this was the rug. So they have in a uh, living room, uh, it looks like a living room from the 60s, exactly what you would expect. And they have a beautiful Kerman in it. But, the, the, um, you know, things have moved on. We went from these nice early European Kerman like that in 1920 to this kind of stuff by 1960, 1970. In Hamadan, they went from these beautiful things to they started, they kept getting busier and busier and they introduced the chrome dyes and they're just not as pretty a rugs. Bijar, the same thing from a beautiful, nice early Bijar to 1925 Bijar to 1950 Bijar. It doesn't have the patina it just doesn't have the softness. It lost all of that in its, in its quality. Tabriz, they went from these beautiful vegetable dyes to Tabriz is using uh, chrome dyes, that bright red, almost a garish red. And um, they just weren't as pretty a rug. Now, you know, that's a pretty rug. It's just not near as pretty as, huh, sorry. Uh, this one is a pretty rug, but not near as pretty as this one. I was pointing to him, but I realized you couldn't see where I was pointing. In Kashan, by 1920, they were producing a beautiful, you know, soft red Kashan. And then they went to funnier colors, different colors. And uh, by the way, this one has about 250 knots per square inch. This has about 100 knots per square inch. Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, they were producing in the early 1900s, they did this great, uh, this is called the Teki Bokara. This is a beautiful bag face. This is a uh, Kachli Bokara from the Turkmenistan area. But Kachli means cross. They just put this big cross in it with the little candelabras and everything. This says about 400, or maybe three or 400 knots per square inch. By 1960, this is a typical Baluch, or here's a typical Afghanistan rug, uh, you know, by 1960. So as you can see, the quality just went down. That's what I call the decline in oriental rugs. Periods in the history of rugs. So this is what took place in, you know, Persia and slash Iran from, uh, you know, 1945 till 1975. However, during that period, there are some rugs that I feel have honorable mention. For instance, Isfahan's, actually they started uh, messing with chrome dyes, but they got better at it. This is a rug with probably 400 knots per square inch. It's woven on silk because it's so finely woven and, uh, Oftentimes in the 60s and 70s, I would get these Isfahans. There was uh, one 
great company in Isfahan known as Sarafi. Sarafi and Isfahan, and they had their classic little uh, signature on their Sarafi and Isfahan. They were fabulous pieces. So these are the honorable mention pieces. Isfahan, Naeem's, uh, started doing all of this wonderful work with uh, silk highlights and beautiful rugs. Most of them were woven on linen and they use, as I said, silk highlights. And uh, uh, Naeem became experts in this top color that you see in the background there. They were experts in shades of blue, either light blue or dark blue. Occasionally they'd introduce a little red, but th these are fabulous rugs from that period. Uh, here's a Another rug that actually, they only started weaving rugs in the city of Goom in a, around 1945, but they did a lot of them. And most of them were all silk. They did a lot of hunts, uh, uh, tree of life designs like this and this one. This isn't a prayer rug per se. It's more of what we would call a tree of life design, but Gooms were fabulous rugs in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, Tabriz, introduce uh, uh, this company called Taba Tabriz, started producing these beautiful Tabriz with a, oftentimes you'd see animals like this. Sometimes they would be a complete hunt scene all over pattern instead of the medallion field and spandrels. It would be an all over pattern with a hunt scene. I think I have a photographic one coming up. But these are the rugs that were produced during the period. Kashan developed this pistachio green color that was just fabulous. And they used it in a lot of their rugs. They did a lot of these all over patterns like this, but some with a medallion, but they were great rugs. They, uh, some of these pieces, their average rug had 250 knots per square inch, just their average rug. So they were doing a fabulous job. So even the Kermans, uh, by the 60s, you know, I kind of laugh because they are sort of old fashioned, but on the other hand, some of them were very finely woven. And as you can see, this is, they're very finely woven rugs. Um, also during this period in between the two renaissances, uh, Kashan did some, you, you know, uh, let me just say Iran, had a wonderful relationship with the United States. And most Iranians loved people in the US. And so uh, Kashan did a lot of these pieces with the eagle and the flag. Tabriz uh, idolized uh, President Kennedy. And so they're beautiful rugs with Kennedy on it. And uh, I've, I've owned one of these, but I don't anymore. But these two pieces I, I own actually. So they did some real interesting stuff like that. Also uh, from the 50s and 60s, they did picture rugs. Tabriz used to do wonderful pieces like this, just really, really finely woven. This is a scene of the, the Last Supper that they did in an Oriental rug. Um, here's a great piece that in Kashan around 1950, well, it's the story of Farhad and Shirin is kind of like our Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Farhad was a, um, a rock stoner and he fell in love with the daughter of the king and uh, Sharon and, and went to the king and asked for permission to marry uh, Sharon. And of course, he, the king didn't want to just say no. So he said, if you can dig a canal from uh, 50 miles away from Tabriz to Tabriz, then you can marry uh, Sharon. Well, so uh, sure enough, Farhad started digging and he was only one day away. He had almost finished the canal and the king was so upset because he said, what am I going to do? And he sent one of his, one of his uh, you know, advisors said, it's obvious you need to go and uh, kill Farhad, but you have to look, make it look like it was a, uh, uh, a suicide. So, um, so that's what the king did. He went and he, and he had someone kill Farhad, made it look like a suicide. Uh, Shirin heard of what happened and she was so sad she killed herself as well. So that's the story of Farhad and Shirin. You can see Shirin there digging the, digging the canal and there's, uh, I mean, Farhad and there's Shirin on horseback and that's uh, the king at the time. So anyway, so, but this is a, a, a Kashan rug 
And it's just a gorgeous rug, beautiful colors, beautiful motif. And this is the kind of stuff they did. So these are the rugs that I call honorable mention. By 1970, Iran was not only producing Naims, Goum, Isfahan, Tabriz, Hariz, Hamadans, Red Saruks, but they, 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 they did this. I told you I would show you a hunt scene, Tabriz. They did these gorgeous hunt scene, Tabriz, with the animals and the, uh, and the hunters and everything. And uh, from southern Iran, there was a rug called an Abade and another one called a Yalame. And these are both rugs from southern Iran up by the city of Hariz. Uh, this was called a Mishkin, and it came from uh, right near Hariz, and they were very popular rugs, very, very popular rugs, uh, and they did great jobs with all of these rugs. Now, I have to say, you know, you look at this stuff, you look at that, and, uh, and you look at, uh, well, if I, I can't go back all the way to the Kermans, but, you know, this is, I always kind of joke with people and tell them this when I'm uh, doing our classes. Uh, it's a disclaimer. Technology evolves and things get better. The same happens with rugs. And I say that because, you know, if I was selling computers and you bought a computer from me in 1970, it would be, you know, giant. It would be giant. And it would be what we would rate slow. But at the time, it was a great thing. But they've just gotten better. So if you come in today and want to buy a computer from me, I show you something, you know, as big as my cell phone, and you go, well, why'd you sell me that piece of garbage in 1970? Well, it was the best they sold at the time, but things get better. We started our business in January of 73. So those Kermans and those Tabris and uh, those things were our bread and butter rugs. We, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures of some Indian and Pakistan rugs that were the, the best that was made at the time. It just doesn't compare with what they're doing today. But so uh, Pakistan was producing this copy. Remember I showed you the uh, Teki Bokara? Well, Pakistan copied it. Uh, the, they were beautiful rugs. However, the poorer quality ones uh, did not tie tight knots. So they were very loosely woven, even though they were small knots, they weren't tightly tied. Uh, Pakistan copied the Mishkin, Pakistan copied Caucasian rugs. And these were all our big selling rugs in the 70s. We started in 1973. And I remember back in those days, and, and the Bokaras were not our most popular rug, but people loved it. We had an auction back in the early days. You know, we started with uh, uh, very little money and it takes a lot of money to stock an Oriental rug store. And so we did have some auctions right at the beginning in the early seventies to sort of raise money. And I had an auction and I had all these great pieces of Tabriz, a Kerman, Isfahan, and I wasn't getting hardly anything for them. And then finally, I put up a Pakistan Bokhara, and the people went crazy over. They paid probably as higher than the retail price of the rug at the time. And I grabbed one of my associates and I said, go around the shop and get every Bokhara we have and bring it here. And I sold a ton of Bokharas because they were very popular rugs. I just don't feel like they compare to what's being sold today. India produced some fabulous rugs. Maybe some of you remember this company named Pandy Cameron, Pandy Cameron of New York. I have a book, uh, I don't know if it's here. I think I have it at the shop, but I have a book. Uh, let me see, it's, it's the history of um, Oriental rug carpet industry. Uh, OCR, Oriental, OCR, Oriental carpet, um, I, don't, I, I can't remember, but it's their history uh, right from when they, the get-go. And OCR actually wound up selling their company to Pandy Cameron. Pandy Cameron took it over. So Pandy Cameron developed all of these different motifs. That's, you know, and they all had different, that was a cafe. This was an Agrippa. I can't remember what that one was. These I bought from another company. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, I don't know if I'm, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this now. Um, what these companies did was they would produce a rug like this, 
And I would buy a six by nine of it and have it hanging on a big rack, a six by nine rack. And you could come in and say, I love this rug, but I need it in a nine by 12. And I'd order it and it would come. It looked exactly like that, only in a nine by 12. It was called programming. And programming was that you had continuity. Continuity meant that you could get the same rug in any any of the standard sizes. I could just order it and they would get it for you in that size. Now, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And in fact, it was. It was it was a great idea at the time. Pandy Cameron and Patterson Flynn and Martin, these companies became famous because of their programmed lines. But let me tell you the downsides of that. Well, first, I already told you in, when we were talking about wool that in India, if you produced a rug in India, you had to use Indian wool. So the wool wasn't that good to begin with. But secondly, to dye a wool and have it come out exactly the same color every time, if there's a lot of lanolin in it, you never know how the dye is going to take, I mean, excuse me, how the wool is going to take the dye. So what they would do is they would bleach the heck out of the wool to get all the lanolin out of it. And that way, then they could have a consistent color every time. Well, I hope you realize what the problem there is. They took all of the lanolin out of the wool, which is what makes rugs la wool last a lot longer is the lanolin that's naturally inside the fiber of the wool. So while these rugs may look beautiful, they had a very dry feeling to them. If you felt the rug, it was a very dry feeling. And that's because uh, the lanolin had been taken out of the wool. They, of course, they used all chrome dyes because you couldn't get vegetable dyes to be con and have continuity at the same time. But that's what happened. It happened in, in, uh, in Pakistan and in India and uh, well, not in Romania. Romania, as I told you, was producing some fabulous rugs. By the way, all three of these rugs are in my home. I love Romanian rugs. And they were producing some fabulous rugs, but they did use uh, chrome dyes. If we had, if Romania was still producing rugs, I think that these would still be real good sellers at our store today. So unlike, uh, unlike those or those. Um, but here's what you could do. You can make it to order. So here, this, here's a sample that, I, and this is in our shop today. You could get a Bokara, one of these rugs, and I could get it in tan background, black background, rust background, ivory background, blue background. You know, every one of these, I could get it made. This was a rug by Pandy Cameron called a Gin Jack, and I could get it in green, tan, blue, uh, you know, uh, I dealt a little bit with this company in China, China National Native uh, Produce and Animal Byproducts Import and Export Company. And I could have them make a rug and I tell them I want the background to be 273, the border to be 257, the inside to be 212, and they would produce a rug exactly, make, you know, custom made to order. Uh, the Bokaras, you know, as I said, you could get them in any color you wanted. That was a great idea at the time. It's just, as I said, in India, they were using dry wool. They were not tying as tight in knots in Pakistan. Um, and, you know, it was all chrome and it just had, it didn't have the patina and the look that we like in Oriental rugs. Oh, gosh. So, uh, gosh, that was, we finished that class quickly. So that's, that's pretty much. I mean, what we're going to do next week is we're going to talk about the third great rug renaissance, and we're going to explain how all of these things just sort of uh, fell out of favor. All of this, which was my bread and butter in 1973, all of this fell out of flavor uh, by, uh, by 1985, and you will see why. Uh, that I believe that the rugs that are being produced today that started around 1985 are some of the very finest rugs made. Well, I hope I, hope I gave you enough material today and I hope I kind of showed you both uh, the decline. And then, as I said, you know, in India with things like this, they thought they were getting back on track and they were doing a really good job. And if you were around in 1973, 
you would say, well, they're, they're doing so much better than what they did in the 40s and 50s. They're getting a lot better at it. But what I'm going to show you next week, you're going to go, oh, my gosh, makes makes these rugs look terrible compared to what they're doing today. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget, if you ever have a question, you can always email us at info at and we'll, we'll answer your email. Or as I mentioned, you can just stop by and see us sometime. Um, let me see. Uh, pick up a free copy. Stop by our shop, Shia or in the Rugs, 1325 Jamestown Road, Williamsburg, Virginia. Thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Next week, we'll be back with class number seven.